So you have your bass, crappie, bluegill, red ear, shell cracker, ever how you want to uh, define that fish. Yeah. Um, catfish fishing is great on on both Kentucky and Barkley. Um, of course, if you go to Pickwick, you've got the old smallmouth that mm-hmm. that is is king down there, so to speak. Right. And um, in, in our collections this year, we saw some really nice, healthy, big smallmouth down there. The award-winning Tennessee Wildcast is on the air with the latest on hunting, fishing, boating, wildlife watching, and all things outdoors. Make welcome your host, drummer and outdoor expert novice, Jason Harmon. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Tennessee Wildcast. Hey, we're glad you're tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, We appreciate y'all being with us each week. And we've got a great show for you today. I have Mr. Michael Clark. He's a reservoir biologist in, uh, in West Tennessee. And Mr. Tim Broadbent, the regional fisheries manager for, for the western part of the state. They're both here today, and we're glad to have them in Nashville. Appreciate uh, you having us. Glad to be here. Yeah, looking forward to what we're going to talk about today. It's all about fish. Uh, we're going to talk about crappie, about bass. Uh, we're going to slide some Asian carp in there, even though that's not the most fun topic sometimes. But I just want to get the information out to you guys. We're also going to be talking about trout. But... Um, to kick it off, I want to advertise this hat once again. Todd, which camera am I on? This one right here? Okay, there you go. Nice, uh, what I would say, vintage kind of oil cloth style hat with a, uh, a agency patch on the front in leather. So that's a really cool hat you can get online at GoOutdoorsTennessee.com. Only 20 bucks. Have y'all got yours yet? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, it's a, a great gift if you want to get one for a friend or get a couple for you. But 20 bucks online, just uh, log in at GoOutdoorsTennessee.com. Uh, sign in there and go under License Catalog and then under Specialty. That's the easiest way to find it. And uh, you can order as many as you'd like. While you're there, you could add on the hard card for 5 bucks or uh, update your license and be ready for the next year. I guess you can't do that yet, but uh, if you don't have a license, you could get you a license to finish out the year uh so anyway appreciate uh you guys being here winter trout stocking is going to be coming up in region one uh, actually it's already happening but uh there's some spots that, that are popular for folks shelby farms uh martin city pond mckenzie city pond uh, are you guys out there stocking those or you got our hatchery guys are right, yeah. right, yeah. So, what if folks? You hear folks talking about those those ponds and, and those places. Are they having a pretty good time out there catching. It's a catch and take, right? Oh yeah, yeah. They want you to take some home. Absolutely, yeah. Career limit of seven, so catch as many as you can. Have fun. Yeah, it's a it's a special program that we do for, especially since Region One don't see many trout a lot of times. You know, so it's an opportunity to catch some trout in the cold cold time of the year. And uh, that's pretty cool. And you mentioned, uh, well, I'll just say this, tmwildlife.org is how you find the, um, the uh, stocking schedule. And it's out there on the homepage, uh, one of those blocks on the homepage, easy to find. But you said something about spring stocking also happens in Region 1 in some places. Yeah. Uh, in the springtime of the year, uh, we have uh, creeks in Stewart, Houston, Humphreys, and Perry counties in Region 1 that, uh, that get multiple stockings. Uh, during the springtime, uh, same thing. Creel Limit of Seven. Uh, they're most of them are marked, and, okay. and all of the locations and stuff are in our fishing guide. So that's a that's a put and take as well, I guess. Yes. Okay. Don't forget your license though. You got to have that trout stamp uh, yep. to to catch these and, and take them home. But that's cool. So the waters are I guess cold enough. It's still spring. It's still cooler time of the year, I guess. It's, Correct. Uh, but enough moving water and cool enough to keep those fish uh, for a little while anyway. Yes. Yeah, and back to the winter trout stocking, they're a great place to take a kid fishing because mm-hmm. they're confined areas, usually, what, acre, acre and a half maybe? Yeah. And we stock several hundred trout, and it's a great place to take a kid fishing and get them introduced to the outdoors. And Yeah. It's a unique fish for West Tennessee. And those little guys, I mean, they fight pretty good, don't yeah. they? Yeah. They, they flip and kick and everything else, so it's, yeah. it's fun to watch folks reeling them in. I know a lot of <clears throat> A lot of guys will, will follow the trailer, you know, or follow mm-hmm. the truck and, and be waiting on those to uh, spit them out. So anyway. Yeah. If the truck doesn't show up, they'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, watch the watch the PDF and, and the list online at tmwildlife.org because that changes periodically. If there's a, a bad snow event or ice or something and we can't get to those ponds, we'll reschedule. So yes. that uh, 
that schedule could uh, could change as we move forward throughout the year. Um, one more current event or announcement here: uh, the San Jose Crane Festival is going to be coming up next weekend, January 18th and 19th. So uh, if you're interested in uh, in watching some San Jose Cranes and, and enjoying that festival, it's out at the Birchwood School in uh, Region Three. Uh, that's down in Meigs County area uh, near the Hiawassee Refuge. So. That's a great time to go watch birds. Have y'all ever been out there? See that? Not yet. See, we got too busy. We're too busy. <laughs> <laughs> January's busy for you guys. It doesn't. It doesn't uh, breathe water. So we're. But it's a it's a fun event, and there's uh, always a lot of festivities around the around the festival. So uh, go check that out. Well, I guess let's jump in. Uh, one of the terms I seen in the email, and we're trying to set this show up and, and get you guys here. I seen this uh, this uh, Y O Y, and I was like, "What does that mean?" Young of year, and you say you've had a good young of year year for crappie and bass. So tell us what's been going on, what y'all been working on, and and what's what's so great about what's been going on, what's been happening. Well, first and foremost, not only with crappie and bass, but also with most of our forage fish as well. Um, it, it's been a great year for reproduction. Um, we uh, we've seen uh, successful reproductions of gizzard and threadfin shad, skipjack, and several of our native uh, species of minnows and stuff have also shown up. Wow. Um, getting into sort of touching base on Asian carp, we we seem to get a lot of calls um, throughout the late spring, early summer of I've got this small fish and I don't know what it is. Could it be a carp? Mm -hmm. So we make several calls out or we make runs out to the river to actually get and collect some of these fish so that we can identify them to to understand whether or not it is a carp definitely and so this has really opened our eyes to how how well the reproduction was this year on our native fish so we're finding out it's not not so much the asian carp that's reproducing it's the the ones we want to yeah exactly and i'll touch base on on the reproduction of the carp later but um back to the to the crappie and bass um every year in the fall time of the year across the state and pretty much every state we use trap nets to uh, to depict uh, how much reproduction we had on our crappie population. Uh, this year was an above average year for both Kentucky and Barkley Reservoirs. Mm. Um, we saw uh, lots of small fish. We saw several age classes of fish in those nets as well, along with our electrofishing uh, surveys as well. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, they um, it's it's above average. Uh, it's been above average for a couple of years now, so I know we're we're not where we all want to be on our fish populations and fish structure, especially on Kentucky Lake, seeing a little bit of a dip. But uh, for the most part, uh, the future looks good. Awesome, awesome. And as far as the bass, um, again, with some of the the carp calls and just reasons for us to need to be out there during the summer months and stuff, we witnessed several. Uh, young of year bass in, in I mean they were like secondary catches we were we were looking for other species and mm -hmm. and they were they were coming up um, this fall we tried to focus some of our collection efforts to to the to the young of year bass just to get an understanding of it and it, it looks good as well explain to folks they, if they're watching we can draw a line here maybe but how big is a young of year bass that, that you're that you're collecting or seeing in these nets oh they're Six inches, four, eight yeah, inches, something like that. Four to four to eight inches, just okay. depending on what time of year you 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 come across them and stuff. Yeah, so they're seeing a lot of those, yes. and, and the numbers are looking good. That's awesome. Yeah, the crappie that we're collecting in our trap nets, they're three to five inches. Okay, so that you know they're a little smaller. Yeah, awesome. And you talk about the trap nets. So explain to folks what those, how those work, and and do you just randomly select your locations, or you got some kind of method on where you're trapping and that kind of thing? It's historic sites. Okay. Um, they've been sampled for 30 plus years. Um, the nets are, um, they, they have a, a lead on them of 100 feet. Then it, it sort of funnels fish into two rectangular 
uh, squares okay. that the fish get into, and then it's almost it's set up like a barrel net or a hoop net at that point where it has narrowed throats, mm-hmm. and then it goes into the barrel rings to the caudal end of the of the line, and um, we pull it from the caud end up when we're running them and dump the fish out and reset the trap or pull the trap up and move it somewhere else. Cool, awesome, and yeah, I guess y'all are collecting data on these fish and making notes and that kind oh, of thing. Oh, absolutely! Uh, all of our data goes into a, d- a data analysis program, uh, and then annual reports are written on a yearly basis to uh, to get the word out of what we saw and and sort of what the future holds. Yeah. What's, what's one of the biggest ones you've caught in, in one of these nets? I mean, I'm, I guess the funnel can be pretty tight. Sometimes you can't get real big ones, maybe. But what's some of the biggest you've caught oh, in these nets? The, uh, this year in my nets that I help run, I know we caught some 14, 15-inch crappie. Mm. So, wow. I mean, yeah, they once they get in there, they might be a little harder to get out. Yeah. But, but, uh, <laughs> they found a way in. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, they can uh, get in there easy. Yeah. And I, I'm your shocking efforts, too. I'm sure you're, you're rolling up some big bass and, and – yeah, you can probably tell a few folks a few places to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we do know some hot spots, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah, so. but uh, yeah, seven, eight, nine pound fish, fairly common. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's awesome. And I guess J- Jason, the one thing we want to make people aware of is that reservoir population cycle. I mean, you can't have good populations of crappie and bass all the time every year because that's just the the character of a reservoir. They right. their productivity is different, so you're gonna have these. Ups and downs of populations. And that's what we've experienced here in the last, what, five years, Michael, probably? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a couple years of poor. We got a couple years of good. We, had, we dipped again for a couple years, and this past year was really good. So we are we understand the frustration with an angler because they had it. Bass fishing particularly was really good for 15 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's the best it's ever been on Kentucky Reservoir. Uh, it's dipped a little bit this year. Fishing pressure's down, but the big fish are still there. We just had a little issue with recruitment there for a while. Yeah, yeah. I, I've not fished on Kentucky and Barkley much. I did fish on Kentucky once with uh, Roger Bitts, one mm-hmm. of the other fisheries guys. I think he moved east and works in the eastern region now. But but uh, we caught some good fish that day. And knowing the right techniques and the right kind of bait to use, that, that plays a big factor. And and finding those schools and knowing how to read those uh, mm-hmm. those. Uh, Side Fish scans. finders, yeah, side scans and all yeah. that kind of stuff. They're getting the technology is really improving the the ability to find those fish. I know it's not called fishing anymore; it's called catching almost. <laughs> <laughs> Do y'all use side scan technology in some of your sampling? Yes, yeah. Most of our uh, shocking boats and stuff have it. Um, sometimes it's used for just marking our gear so that we're you know if something comes up we lose a float or whatever we, we know where to come back to 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 look for our net other times it's that you know we can turn side scan on and actually scan beds or, or areas of, of an embayment and see if we can find fish and target those fish and see what they are wow that's cool that's awesome so um the young of the year we covered that um your sampling, you use the trap nets for the crappie. Um, talk to us about summer bass. I had that down here as a note. What's uh, what's happening in the summer with the bass? Well, uh, our, our other sampling that we do other than trap netting is every spring and fall, we bring out the electrofishing boats. Okay. And we have, uh, again, assigned embayments and, and sites in those embayments to, to sample every spring. Uh, we have... 24, I think, embayments on Kentucky Lake. We have another eight on Barkley and six on Pickwick that we that we target every spring. Okay. And then in the fall, we go back to the same areas, not necessarily the exact same sites. And what we're looking for there is just numbers of fish and condition of those fish and, and how they're looking as, they, as they're getting ready for winter. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And then... Um there's there's a lot of work going on with the Florida largemouth uh, in y'all's area. The Humboldt hatchery is uh, is raising some Florida largemouth. Talk to us a little bit about what's going on there. Yeah, uh, Humboldt is a state of the art hatchery with the Florida largemouth bass program. They can manipulate the air temperature and get the water temperatures up to where these bass can spawn earlier than what we normally get in other hatchery raceways. So if they raise between five hundred thousand a million. Wow. Uh, young of year, fingerling, large mouth, uh, Florida largemouth bass every year, and that contributes to stocking Florida largemouth bass throughout the state. On Kentucky Reservoir, we stock 150,000 in three embayments. Okay. 
and we're evaluating that. We're looking at aging growth and uh, percentage of large, Florida largemouth bass alleles in the population so we can determine whether we've been successful or not with our Florida largemouth bass stockings. But it's a real aggressive program. The anglers love it because Chickamaugas made yeah. everybody <laughs> made everybody jealous of, of Chickamauga. So uh, we're it's it's but it's not a guaranteed result. That was going to be my question. I mean, people are so excited about this fish, and they they know Chickamaugas had so much success, but you just can't put them in every water, every body of water, and and it's just going to flourish like it has. You know, there's a a certain line that you know, and that's a lot of more science and deeper conversation probably than we can get into that today. Today, but it's just amazing how people really want it, but it just doesn't work a lot of times in all those different bodies of water. Yeah, if you put them in an area they don't do well, then you're going to have actually negative results. You're going to okay. have slower growing bass and can lower condition, and things aren't going to be quite as what you want your goals to be. So we're careful in where we've selected our sites right now. Mm -hmm. We have Harmon Creek, Eagle Creek, and Blue Creek on Kentucky Reservoir. And we're really looking at those areas hard, and, and we're evaluating – like I said, aging growth and leak frequency determine if we are successful. And, of course, we'll be collecting information with electrophoresis to get our Florida largemouth bass alleles and see what percentage they are now compared to what it was when we started. Yeah. Well, we'll have to get down down there or over there to Humboldt and, and do a show sometime from the facility so folks watching can check it out. And oh, we'd love to have you. It's a really neat facility. Learn more about the process and go a little deeper, you know, into what's going on there. That's That's really cool. That's great that we can – raise those ourselves here we used to bring them from florida right we well we to. still get some from louisiana and texas okay. but florida sort of florida didn't like giving out their fish anymore <laughs> <laughs> that's all right that's all right yeah. they yeah. work hard uh, well tell, tell folks what they can catch on these on these reservoirs uh, kentucky and barkley and, and even pickwick if you got some data on that but like what are folks catching and what kind of bait are they using can we can we give them a little tip and tricks here well uh pretty much any of the reservoirs have the same fish species in them so you have your bass crappie bluegill red ear or shell cracker ever how you want to uh define that fish yeah um catfish fishing is great on on both kentucky and barkley um of course, if you go to Pickwick, you've got the old smallmouth that mm -hmm. that is is king down there, so to speak. Right. And um, in, in our collections this year, we saw some really nice, healthy, big smallmouth down there. Um, I, I heard from one of uh, our guys that there was a tournament this past weekend, and uh, there were uh, the winning bag was like twenty seven pounds wow. for five fish. So that's that's a really good, mm -hmm. really good average um, for a tournament. So um, everything's looking up. As far as uh, hot spots of time to fish, it's usually March, April, May, mm -hmm. and sort of September, October, November, sort of the spring and fall times. Yeah. Of course, you know, you can go fishing year-round as far as that's concerned. Um, right now, with the, the colder water temperatures and stuff, I'm hearing uh, crankbaits and spitterbaits for bass are, are seeming to be – the more successful stuff and um, two different methods of uh, going after the crappie are uh, jig tip minute with minnows okay and uh, slow trolling crankbaits seem to be the gotcha. two hot ways to uh, to catch crappie so there you go you heard it from the experts <laughs> yeah and crop, crappie fishing is really good this fall we've had a lot of good reports on people catching their limit actually catching limits of crappie on kentucky and that's Something hasn't been very common in the last couple of years. Mm. I, crappie are one of the best eating fish. I'd have to say it's 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 great to catch and take home. Um, but also, even the Asian carp are pretty good too. People complain about those guys, and they they taste great as well. I was I was going to mention that if you did. So <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you did. But yeah, yeah we've uh, we've tried to to get that word out about the the food quality of the asian carp of course mm -hmm. you know you got the floating y bones in those fillets that still cause a little bit of an issue with the cleaning and stuff but there's youtube videos out there from uh professional people from usgs all the way down to just fishing guides and mm -hmm. and everybody else that gives you the the helpful techniques on how to clean them and how to prepare them but uh yeah we've we've cooked a bunch and we've tried to spread the word locally even sharing some with some of our other work crews and stuff 
you know, yeah. around just so that they can go out and and be a be somewhat of a of an example of hey, I tried it and it, it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It depends on how you cook it. You could you could overcook it just like anything, oh, you know, yeah. and, and mess it up. But it's it's pretty good, just lightly battered and deep fried. You know, just, uh, absolutely. It's great. Um, uh, Tim, tell us about the Asian carp a little bit. Let's let's jump in there just a little bit. You know, West Tennessee is battling that right now, and and give us just a little life history in, on these fish. Well, uh, obviously, Asian carp are our biggest management uh, problem for the future. They're they're abundant. They impact all populations of buffalo, paddlefish, anything that eats plankton, mm-hmm. and of course, all your young fish eat plankton. Okay. So they compete with them for fit, for food, so that that causes a problem. But right now, um, Asian carp do not eat fish. Number one, they do not eat fish, and they don't eat grass. So we get a lot of misinformation out there that these fish do eat fish and grass, and they're just plankton feeders. I think the big head carp, which is the one that does not jump, mm-hmm. is primarily a zooplankton feeder. And the silver carp, which is the one that you see jumping out of the water, right. they they eat primarily phytoplankton. So it uh, but they will eat both. But they are they are an issue. They are a problem for people, and people are shying away from going fishing and recreating on Kentucky Reservoir and Barkley because of these fish. But uh, and they can be a problem. They jump out of the water in your boat. Believe right, me, right. they are an issue. Can be dangerous, but uh, you know I don't think we're seeing. Are we seeing the populations that we? That, that we think we were or, or are they growing or do you see them increasing or we don't we're from our samples from what we've seen they're still abundant okay. and but they're not moving upstream past pickwick very much they haven't moved up to like gunnerville or nickajack or gun or chick or chickamauga or anything like that they're sort of staying put right now which was a little surprise to us i think we thought they'd continue migrating upstream mm-hmm but um, I, they, they're a fish that is very adaptable to the environment. They start spawning when the water temperature hits about 65, and they'll spawn all the way up to August or September, kind of like bluegill. Mm-hmm. And, but primarily, they like to spawn on the rise. When the rise, water level rises, they like to do their thing. Mm-hmm. And, but we haven't seen any, since 15, we haven't seen any reproduction of uh Silver carp in Kentucky or Barkley Reservoirs, so no. that's that's a plus. Oh yeah, definitely. If we can keep the little fish from recruiting to the fishery or to the population, then we can we think we can make an impact with commercial fishing, and commercial fishers are the solution to this problem. Yeah, that was one thing I wanted to touch on the HIP program. Uh, you got some commercial guys out there catching large numbers of fish. Uh, I think to date, maybe it might be a little bit more than this, but 2.3 million pounds some of the guys have brought in through that program. Yeah, in Tennessee. You're in right. Tennessee. And you said maybe three or so in, in Kentucky. In Kentucky, yeah. Uh, so that's that's amazing. And this, these fish are going to uh, grocery stores. They're going to uh, lobster fisheries in, in the north. And so they have a... They can be used for many different things, right? You know, yeah. and, and uh, so that's awesome to see the success that they're having uh, with that HIP program. You know, the HIP program is is something we started this year. Yeah, I right? think yeah, it's really I think new. It was this year, mm-hmm. and so we we were funded four hundred fifty one thousand. Right now, our funding is, and we have four hundred thousand from the agency, and TVA donated fifty one thousand, which right. was a great. We really appreciate that. Yeah, good partnership. Yes, absolutely. And so the HL program works where we have so many commercial fishers that are contracted with our wholesale fish markets who are contracted through our HL program. And we mm-hmm. pay them 20 cents a pound to harvest Asian carp. And the, Ten. Ten uh, cents a pound. 20 total. Okay. 20 total. We, we pay 10 out of the HL. Right. And then they're paying 13, I think. Right. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. No, no problem. Uh, but... Totally, they get twenty. When they bring an Asian carp, they get twenty cents a pound. Okay, right. cool. So it's it's a, and we feel like I said it's a really popular program. And also, in addition, uh, when a guy starts fishing commercial fish, we give him fifteen hundred yards of net so he can build his nets. We won't give him the net built, but he can he gets the right. webbing, 
And so that's also a plus for the fishers. And if they harvest 60,000 pounds, they get another 1,500 yards. Mm, there's the incentive part. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I mean, that's great to see how well it's working. And, and one thing I wanted to touch on before we run out of time is the – the size, you know, we had that alert us if you see the small Asian carp, and you say we're not really seeing that much right. lately. But have you had any people, anybody sending those in or photos <laughs> trying to comp- – I know you said you get calls and you go out and look at them and yeah. check them. We, we've had all sizes and and all species of fish brought to our attention, uh, both in person, uh, pictures, text message, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the public is, is definitely seeing our, our – reply or request and right, they're good. replying with, with some accuracy uh we haven't seen any in kentucky or barkley reservoirs in the tennessee sections anyways um i'm i try to stay in good contact with our partners on the north of us their uh, kentucky mm-hmm. department of fish and wildlife and um they saw some young of year fish from this year uh, somewhat migrating upstream from the ohio river okay but they never trailed them all the way to the dams or had any kind of um, idea that they locked through or anything. Gotcha. So they were out there, yeah. and and somebody from the Mississippi River that, that commercial fishes over there and everything, they reached out to me this summer and said, I've got you some small Asian carp. And then when we finally figured out he was from the Mississippi River, we I understood. We took a deep breath. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but I still wanted to have some sure. uh, for testing and stuff. So I met him, and he he donated me about sixty of those small fish because he was using them for catfish bait. Okay. I mean, he he was he was actually utilizing the resource in a in a positive way. He was getting rid of Asian carp All by right. using them as bait. So that's great too. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting because on Mississippi River you'll have natural reproduction fairly. Regular. Mm. I mean, I, yeah, they'll skip a year or two, but like I said, since 15, we haven't seen anything on Tennessee or Cumberland Rivers, which is encouraging, right. to say the least. That's great. Maybe that barrier that we've got in place is helping out, too. Uh, we don't know yet. They're still, still testing. Still, and still testing. You know, yeah. it's on, running, I think. But, right. Uh, but, yeah, um, it's good to see that in place, and maybe if it works, we can put more in other places if we need to, you know. Yeah, I think that's where pressure from – politicians and things is, is going to help yeah yeah well i think it's been a lot of good information i appreciate you guys coming out today anything else real quick that you wanted to bring up if not well we have plenty of asian carp studies that are going on uh everything from larval fish to adult fish um we've got cooperative stuff in place with uh, all of the states around us especially mm-hmm. on the tennessee and cumberland river systems and we're also partnering with uh, universities like Murray State, Tennessee Tech, and uh, now we've got Mississippi State awesome. and Arkansas Pine Bluff cool. on board. So uh, we're we're doing as best we can. Doing a lot of work. Yeah, we're, yeah. Working hard. We appreciate these guys, all the work they do, fisheries, wildlife, all these divisions. They're, they're out there working for the sportsman and, and the, the wildlife watcher and people who enjoy Tennessee's natural resources, and we appreciate what you guys do. Uh, we appreciate it also. So, Tim, Michael, I appreciate you guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time on Tennessee Wildcast. Thanks for tuning in. Stay connected with TWRA by visiting our website at tnwildlife.org. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hey, it's all about Tennessee wildlife. It's what we do. Tennessee Wildcast will be on the air again next week. We'll see you then.